Good morning. Before we call the meeting to order, I would just like to introduce myself. My name is Carla Van Hagen. I'm the Senior Deputy Clerk of the Board for the Board of Supervisors, and I've been asked to assist in clerking these meetings, so I'm very happy to be here. Um, you'll see things are a little different just because I wasn't here before, so um, if, if things should be differently laid out, just let me know. I'm happy to change it in the future. Um, meeting packets and agendas are in the back. If you'd like to speak on any item on the agenda, just if you fill out a speaker card, it will help me get your name correct in the minutes. It's not required, it just helps me to get your spelling correct. And there's also an option on here if you'd like to be included on the distribution list, you can put your email address on there and I can update the distribution list as well. Um, so just wanted to say hi and thank you for having me. Thank you for doing it. Uh, <clears throat> would you like to Okay, so this meeting has come to order. It is now 1.01 p.m. and I'll go ahead and take roll. Um, Sheriff Almond? Here. CEO Angelo? Here. Dr. Barash? Chair Barash? Here. Um, Member Diamond? Here. Member Liberty? Here. Member McGordy? Here. Dr. Miller? Here. Member Machete? Maschetti. Maschetti. <laughs> yes. Like spaghetti. Yeah. I, I, like I knew it was going to happen. Member Maschetti? <laughs> Member Riley? Here. And Auditor Weir? Here. So, would anybody in the public like to uh, give an expression? Oh, oh my gosh, I'm so sorry. I did skip right past you. I apologize. Uh, Member Myrtle? Here. Thank you. <laughs> my fault. It was the spaghetti thing. It's the, the mosquito threw me. I apologize. Marvin, please uh, give your name before you start. I'm members of the board. Um, Marvin Trotter, I'm the Chief Medical Officer at Union City, and I'm here to urge you to make a vote for uh, the Orchard Avenue for project. Um, I think that's the quickest, uh, best way to proceed with your funds at this time. I don't see um, that it isn't uh, a priority at some point in the future. It's what was suggested by your Kemper report. Um, I think it will give us immediate help uh, counseling and beds. Um, I know there's some issues that I'm sure uh, Ms. Elliott will figure out uh, uh, with the project, but in some form or manner, uh, I think it's the low hanging fruit. Um, you have much more complex issues in front of you, but I would urge you to at least vote in favor of the project so we can work on whatever other issues are necessary. Thank you, Dr. Trump. Uh, actually, yes. I'm sorry. I I didn't hear what you said. Okay. What specifically? It, what the Orchard project? Avenue project, which is the two-story building uh, with mental health, where they'll do crisis counseling, also have beds for crisis stabilization. Um, it's the RCS uh, oh. <coughs> project uh, in Ukiah. I think. I'm sorry, I wasn't. Sorry for my bad hearing. Uh, my my bad communication. Thank you, Dr. That, uh, thank you very much, Dr. Barish. <laughs> this is breaking uh, press time. Like call. <laughs> uh, so, may we have an approval of the minutes from the uh, December 19th meeting? Uh, I just wanted to do a brief oh, note of oh, no, anything else. Uh, first of all, I'd like to thank Dora for last year yes. and everything that she did. Um, it was great. I have talked to Carla and I have read this month's minutes and they are, they are well done. And there will be more narrative in the next month's minutes. And we are now having them transcribed so that anyone can look and see and refer to the minutes in lieu of having to watch a two and a half hour video, and that's all I wanted to say. And thank you, Carl. Can I have a motion for approval of the minutes? I move that they be approved. Jed? I will toot it. Second. I'll uh, oppose. Anybody opposed to that? Uh, moving on to election of the vice chair. Wait, we can, oh, we can, we can, we can, so 
As a point of order, generally the clerk will call a vote for after a motion and will poll for eyes or nays. Is that not historically how it's been done? Okay, just want to make sure that. Okay. <laughs> I don't want to interrupt, but historically that's how that's how so we can record it into onto the video and to the audio as well as onto the minutes. So we'll start with um, Member Diamond. Yes. Sheriff Almond. Yes. Member Riley. Yes. Member Myrtle. Yes. Member Muschetti. Yes. Um, out of your weir. Yes. Member Liberty. Yes. CEO Angelo. Yes. Member McGordy. Uh, usually we just take them. Yeah. Yes. Okay. <laughs> so you you are being recorded. So. Yeah. The, right. the purpose yeah. of the audio is is because um, especially when we're doing a transcript, it's important to hear that person's audio response because the transcript won't pick up a raise of the hand or a lowering of the hand. So. Yes. Yes. Correct. Yeah. So it, it would be helpful if, if we could do it that way. Thank you. And um, Reverend Miller. Dr. Yes. Yes. Thank yes. Uh, moving on to agenda item 3B, election of the Vice Chair of Mental Health Treatment at Citizens Oversight Committee. Uh, sponsor. That's, that's you. That's me. me. Well, it's me. <laughs> <laughs> so the, the rules of procedure call that um, a Vice Chair be elected uh, at the first meeting of the year. Um, and that item is open for um, discussion and or a motion. Yeah, I'd like to nominate uh, Donna Muschetti for vice chair. I think she'd be a good good candidate and a good balance for the chair who's now in power. Very good. And Ross seconded. Yeah. Uh, is there any discussion? You have to ask me if I <laughs> We were just assuming. Do you accept Donna? Yeah, I guess this must be. <laughs> <laughs> All right, now do you go around again? Yeah, I, I, I do. That, I do that every time. I'm sorry. <laughs> All right, so the motion is by a member Diamond, um, seconded by Member Liberty, to nominate um, Member Muschetti to uh, as vice chair of the committee. Um, we'll take the vote. Um, member Diamond? Yes. Sheriff Holman? Yes. Member Riley? Yes. Member Myrtle? Yes. Member Muschetti? No. Yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Um, Chair Barash? Yes. Auditor Weir? Yes. Member yes. Liberty? CEO Angelo? Yes. Member McCordy? Yes. And Dr. Miller? Yes. Motion carries unanimously. Right. So, can we ask for public comment on uh, each of these? If, if anyone wanted to speak, they could step forward. Is there anybody who would like to make any comment on our proceedings? <laughs> So, moving on to the um, auditor's report, discussion possible action regarding expenditure and report on Measure B tax funds. Uh, <clears throat> so, you should all have a um, summary in your packet <clears throat> for the uh, Mental Health Treatment Act fund. Uh, this is a restricted fund that I'm supposed to keep, keep all the funds separated in. <clears throat> this is my standard format that I bring you every month, and um, this month there is one change to the revenues, which is in the top portion of the report. Um, <clears throat> Excuse me, Lloyd, can you, you tell us where it is in the stack of things we were given? Uh, this far down. <laughs> okay, towards the top. Got it. It's right underneath the, um, the, the cover sheet that says 3C. Okay, I'll find it. Sorry, go ahead. All right. Um, so the only change for this month is the uh, rep in the revenue section at the top. So we have now inserted the line dated December 26, 2018, for our October tax proceeds of 652,942, bringing our total tax proceeds to 4,711,904 to date. Um, below, our expenditures have not changed. There been no new expenditures. Um, and at the bottom, you can see there's a life-to-date interest of $3,400. So the total fund balance in the fund at this point in time is uh, 4,000,000. 
216, 255. That's all I have. So, is, is there any public comment on uh, Hold the phone. <laughs> is that a question? Um, can, you, can you state your name for the record? I'm getting ready to do that. Yes. <laughs> um, Carol Hester, if I remember correctly. Um, weren't you supposed to include um, uh, Maybe this is just history, but weren't weren't a, um, a consultant ED? Is that weren't we going to do a line item? Um, so what you're looking at here is um, actual fund actual. actual funding <clears throat> okay. and expenses. The budget included an item for uh, those those expenditures, and is in the process of being approved by the board. Okay. And then once the once the budget is approved and set, uh, then we can. Uh, that comes into this. Get sent them. Thank pay you. for them out of this. All right, thank you. So, uh, measure uh, item three, three B discussion and possible action regarding update from the county council regarding the legal issues raised by. Excuse me, uh, Ace, could, could you talk a little louder? I'm, I'm well, not hearing it, I'm not sure. We're not hearing it. Yeah, All right, I'll talk louder. Thanks. So uh, good afternoon, uh, Catherine Elliott, County Council, and I am happy to report that this uh, I brought this item to the Board of Supervisors to determine if they would agree to my spending my time at these meetings um, and also to discuss funding because, of course, when I'm here, I'm not doing uh, other items. And uh, the board unanimously agreed that I should be at these meetings and unanimously agreed that um, that this this should be just part of my job coming here that this would not they would not be asking for measure B funds um, they know this as a citizens committee and that this was uh, supported uh, in the popular vote and they want to give their support to this committee as well so those were some of the things I heard from my board in coming here um, there were four questions uh, that were sent, and I, I, just to explain sort of my own process, and um, I, I have several attorneys in my office that specialize in different items that come before this board. I am going to try and give you sort of general guidance as we go through this, as opposed to written legal opinions. Um, I, I think that will be helpful, and I think ultimately when we go forward and the board does sign on to something and, and start going forward with it, that's when, if there was an issue or a problem, I would, I would give a full written opinion. Um, if, there's, if it's needed for this, I would probably do that, but I don't think that we will have enough specifics for me to give you that written opinion. I also think by sitting in these meetings and hearing what's going on and where the questions come from, I can respond uh, quicker um, and, again, try and give you some direction. So I've got four questions here, and the first one is a legal opinion regarding the City of Willits claims as to jurisdiction of reutilizing the old Howard Hospital as a PHF, etc. facility. Um, the great thing about the law is it's complex. <laughs> so, um, and I, I will say, uh, just for um, information's sake, um, my understanding is this was a question that was posed uh, by Mr. Liberty, so I specifically met with him and some of my staff in my office to explain some of the complications. So uh, the answer, See if I can do the simple answers. And again, I'm not my I'm not the planning and building person in my office, but um, the answer is that basically a county-owned property is we oversee our own county-owned property. We are subject to our own rules and not the city's rules. So that's a simple answer. The secondary answer, however, is looking at um, it's 22 CCR 77039 which is um, what will change that answer is the certification from the state. What kind of certification are we seeking? Um, you know, what are we doing? And so the, the state then can impose um, 
local restrictions from the local entity on whatever building we're doing. So again, it depends on if we own it. You know, uh, there are many exceptions to that. So that that uh, that rule only applies if it's the county. The rule is different if it's a private entity, as I understand it. Um, so there are. So in other words, there are other steps we would have to go through to make sure that we comply with perhaps uh, city rules, et cetera, depending on what the state mandates. And it's my understanding and speaking with uh, CEO Angelo that um, I believe uh, she and uh, I believe Tammy Moss Chandler have reached out to the state with regard to our uh, state requirements um, and what we need to do in terms of licensing. So I know that's been looked at and is in process, but again, I would have to get into the very specifics of what kind of building, how we were doing it in, in order to understand those. Um, also, I wanted to bring uh, attention, and uh, Dr. Milla could address this as well as I could, is California Welfare and Institution Code 4080. And so what that says is it's regarding licensing of psychiatric health facilities. Uh, psychiatric health facilities shall only be licensed by the State Department of Healthcare Services um, subsequent to the application by the county. For counties, um, once they choose to apply, the local mental health director shall first present to the local mental health advisory board for its review an explanation of the need for the facility and a description of the services to be provided. The local mental health director shall then submit to the governing body, the Board of Supervisors, the explanation and description, and the governing body, upon its approval, may submit the application to the State Department of Health Care Services. So I'm just trying to get you an idea of how this process works to kind of explain what, what you're going to be going through. So, um, so I, and I will say, all of, again, all of my sort of legal advice here are the sort of general principles. There are always exceptions to the rules. So, um, so number two, Board of Supervisors' legal ability to spend Measure B funds on building and or improving facilities not owned by the county. So we, the county can give money uh, to uh, enhance a, a building owned by somebody else. Um, it would not be considered a gift of public funds if it was done for uh, the public good. However, this committee is a citizen's committee that is put here to oversee this funding. And I can tell you trying to put enough um, restrictions, oversight, et cetera, to somebody else's buildings with the county money would be very difficult indeed. Um, and we would be at risk of investing the, the um, county's monies uh, as given to us by the citizens um, into a building that we would lose control of and have nothing in the future to show for that. So as far as the legal side of that, one answer is yes, we could do that. Two, would that be probably a very bad idea? I would say so because we would not be able to legally have enough oversight in the future and um, those funds I, as my understanding and reading this one of the big issues is getting a facility built or a facility that we have control over and um, we could lose that control um yeah i just you said that um if a building is county property then the county would be in charge, and I wasn't quite sure if the old Howard Hospital sits on county property. No, not currently, but if we were to purchase it, then it would become the county property. And um, in, the, in the case of a partnership, as with Adventist Health, um, that, uh, I mean, I can see certain advantages to doing something like that, but I wonder if you'd comment on that, because you said in general, for the county not to own a building that they're investing money in is a bad idea. I wonder if there's any way around that to have such a partnership. Uh, again, so you know, it's it's looking in the future in terms of control, um, and part of why I'm here is because I haven't heard all the prior discussions, so I don't know all of the things that you're considering. Um, so I'm just trying to give you some guidance. 
um, and direction. Uh, the measure B <coughs> itself, you know, isn't specific. So it, and again, you are the citizens' oversight committee to try and make sure that we spend this money wisely. Um, there are other ways, for example, you're talking about a partnership with the hospital. One of the things might be that the hospital gives us part of their property and we build a building next to the hospital. I mean, that would be an answer to that, where we would have, again, more oversight in terms of that building and yet be able to work collaboratively. Yes, sir. Yeah, I wanted to question to you and maybe others on the committee that would know since you haven't been here before. Would this uh, apply to the orchard facility that we've talked about and that Dr. Trotter had just spoken to earlier? Uh, it's my understanding that that facility is not owned by the county presently. Can, can we get some clarification of how that might affect that potential think, use of the facility? I think with the county council's guidance, uh, RQMS has offered to donate the facility to the county. To, uh -huh. get, to, to change title, so you know, and I, I suppose part of the reason to have county council here is to help us make these kind of decisions. Okay, is that the sense of those that have been studying this a little more? You're nodding your head, Ross is saying yes. Or? I'd like to hear from, from county council. Is that true? Well, again, I'm hearing discussions that I haven't been involved in, so I don't. <clears throat> I, I, so I don't know the answer about this donation back. Again, if they were donating it back to us and it became county property, we're in a very different situation. Oh, can, I, uh, can I address, can I give an example, or is that outside the scope of this item? Yeah. Yeah. Okay, so, that's, I guess that's your question. I mean, you're, well, you're trying to try and understand the answers I'm giving you, right. so yes, right. you can so, give me a, a example, I think. So Ukiah Valley Medical Center has just built a new addition to the hospital and in doing so they have an intensive care unit that's vacant right now. And so one of the proposals was to create a psychiatric hospital, a small psychiatric addition to the acute hospital, which would be owned by Adventist Health, it's part of their hospital. The advantage to us is that they would run the facility. Um, but uh, just as as a partnership, we would pay the costs of renovation. All right. So let's just go down that road. So the county then pays all the money for the renovation. How long a contract can we enter to assure that we get that continued use for that purpose? Well, that's exactly what I wondered if we could <coughs> Not long. Not, not long. I mean, you know, so, I mean, I think that's where you get into trouble. I mean, there's, there's always ways, contracts can always be broken. I mean, I see. So you can't, even if you make a long contract, I mean right now, for example, Howard Hospital has a 50-year contract with uh, the um, Howard Foundation to run the hospital. Right. So, and, and I'd be glad to come back on that question to, uh, because again, we have other <coughs> private entities have different contracting rights in the county. Um, so I would want to explore what kind of thing we could do in terms of long run. What I am saying is, it's more difficult if it's not a county-owned facility. So, not impossible. Um, number three, conditions in which Measure B funds can be used for construction of facilities without paying prevailing wage rates. Again, the general answer is that there are there are none. I mean, that's the general answer. Um, we have to. Uh, if we're, it's county and we're going forward, the county would have to be paying for prevailing wages. Well, again, now here's, this gets back to the, the, the original one. So in the building of the orchard facility, um, I think uh, part of the problem in approaching this is that there's not a lot of construction teams in the county just because of all the fires that happened recently and one of the issues was that our QMC could actually use their in-house construction team and being as if they're a private entity they wouldn't have to pay prevailing wage so it would save a lot of money um, and again could we could we manage this contractually in such a way that that they promise to use that uh, as, for some acceptable length of time as a so this is the situation you're putting me in. You're saying, as the lawyer for the county, I'm going to advise you how to go around the prevailing wage. 
mandate. <laughs> I see. Okay, so that wouldn't look good. No. <laughs> it, it, wouldn't, it wouldn't be right. And again, one of the things I say in terms of my ethics lectures, et cetera, is we are one of the bigger employers in this county. People have a right to bid for our business. They have a right to be paid prevailing wages. Um, that's okay. not that only is, the legal is, thing to do, it's the right thing to do. So. This is good for those of us who are not sophisticated in these issues <laughs> to learn. So again, there are, you know, all of the things that I'm saying, there may be exceptions in terms of specific, um, for example, this, uh, it could be, we could go out for a grant. The grant could have specific instructions. You know, there are certain other things, but the general rule is no. Um, and in respect to design build contracts, can the design contractor also be the build contractor? Um, and goes on to say, do county procurement procedures preclude this similar to federal procedures? Yes, county procurement procedures in this regard um, do uh, mirror the federal. So uh, design build contractors, the design contractor cannot be the build contractor. And some of that is laid out in um, the uh, conflicts of interest code, I believe it's 1090. Uh, which is, um, yes, 10, Government Code 1090, which says basically that creates a, a conflict um, because uh, you have somebody bidding on this and they have, of course, obviously, sort of the inside hand on them having to the design. So, so again, that's the general rule. And hopefully then. I uh, look at state uh, contracts registered with bid uh, daily. And it's very common for design, build, public works contracts. Um, it's, it's, I could bring examples to the next meeting where so, they have yeah. design, build contracts. So I don't believe that is accurate. So, so are you looking at city or county? Oh, I'm looking at public works contracts. For the city? That could be city, county. Uh, state. Okay. I mean, because the cities have different rules. Right. So, so I, I, don't, I, don't under, I don't understand where you have that, that. What qualifications there are. And I've, I've worked for contractors that have done school projects of the design build, which means that the, they sent out a design build contract proposal. And they had design build contractors bid on that. So it wasn't conflict because everyone was bidding on the same, on the scope same of things. work. So that's not a conflict of interest, it's a scope of work proposal. Okay. So and maybe I, I so one so I was walked through what this question meant, and so my understanding was once somebody's designed it, you know, can they then build it? So and, and so that was the, alternate scopes of work instead of sending it out as right, a design build right. project. So that was, I, and I'm glad you asked that because that was how this question was described to me. If I'm if I'm right, but so. yeah. So uh, please, <laughs> I, I'm the one bringing the confusion to the table. I'm afraid. I I thought when we looked at the the proposal regarding. Uh, um, uh, Howard Hospital, that they said they they can't do design build because they it's public works. They won't do design build. Not that they can't. They won't. Okay. I, I that's. Okay. I read it differently. Yeah, okay, thank you. So and so I'm glad you asked. And so and so again, I was trying to answer the question. What I thought I heard when we were discussing it is that. Oh no, you got what right, I said. Okay. Maybe I'm wrong. And so and, and so with that yes. clarification, so we understand what question I was trying to answer. So I was trying to answer if can the one come in on the other and answer. If they were no. If they were. But it, it, can you put out a whole if they were package? Independent expense, correct. If they designed it as an independent contract and they built it as an independent contract, right. that would be a conflict of that's, interest. That's a conflict but if it was, if the work was placed together, it could be. If it was advertised 
process as one, as one right. and, project. And I would want to just review that again because this isn't, you know, I would want to review that with my planning and building sure. person. But that's, that wasn't the question I was trying to answer. Okay. So just to clarify. <laughs> Go Ross. Sorry. <laughs> Thank you very much, Ms. Elliott. Is there any public comment on this item? Um, I'd like to ask yes. a question. Yes, sure. So, to clarify the use of public funds, if we were to gift or <coughs> donate money to, say, a business to improve their building, they don't own the building, but we're funding um, a portion of money to that building. Would that still require prevailing wages if it was not earmarked? So I, I'm, I, I need you to clarify. Your okay. Let's so speak you're saying specifically when you're saying speak, they, so the, let's speak specifically. Okay. We were giving Venice Health to help uh, modernize our facility. Okay. As but we had not earmarked the money for that we had given them a gift to help um, provide um, <laughs> funding to modernize the building. Um, is that still required to pay for the wages? Does A own the building and we're giving a gift to you know, supplement the construction? Because so it's not a county owned facility, right, it's, it's, just not a, it's, a, it's a donation. And of course, I don't know any of the hospital rules themselves, so I, I, I can't I can't answer for their side. Um, it, when we're giving, there's certain things when we're giving a gift of funds. There, sometimes there are requirements, sometimes they aren't. But um, I, I don't believe so in that situation. But I would want to also, you know, I'm, I don't like to give legal opinions sort of uh, off the cuff, but I. I I wouldn't imagine so. Okay. And and again, so just to be very clear, you know, the board of supervisors can give money that are things for the public good. That's one issue. The second issue is, what can you do with Measure B funds when they were earmarked for a very specific purpose? So, I think you're under more restrictions in that regard. Thank you very much. Any public comment? Oh, sorry, you can public comment first. Uh, yes. uh, good Can afternoon. John McCallan. <laughs> John McCallan, Board of Supervisors. Uh, the board did uh, authorize County Council to be present to give general guidance to the committee uh, and to not charge uh, any of her time against Measure B. The part of the board discussion was also we recognize many of the legal questions that you're faced with are complicated, complex, require in-depth research. So the board, part of the board discussion was also uh, that this committee should be open to requesting of the county that uh, we authorize hiring of outside counsel to uh, assist county counsel with some of the more complex, time-consuming issues that you may be faced with. And that would be uh, subject to your request, I would say. What, do, and I appreciate him bringing that up, that is the piece. Uh, so the, the question is, if I start doing legal opinions or we have more in-depth, you know, how much time? So one of the things that I, have, my board has requested of me is that I report back to them uh, what hours I'm spending on this so we can determine if we need uh, also outside counsel to assist. I think I got that right. Well, I think it's really if the committee feels it needs that, right. make a request. That's the channel. Right. And, uh, and then I would bring that request back to the board. Okay. Yes. Ms. Hester. Okay. <clears throat> Carol Hester. So, um, Excuse my dumbness, but so does this mean then, <clears throat> County Council, that we have no options at this day that we can go forward, y'all can go forward and make a decision? Uh, we can't do the orchard because of this. We can't do the hospital because of this. We can't do Adventist uh, the Howard Hospital because of this. So to me, it seems like we're now, y'all are now talking about another month 
or two or three or four. <laughs> There's no answer. Well, so and I, I want to say again, just to have procedure. Um, normally, this, the public doesn't ask questions. You get to ask questions of staff. Um, question goes back through the chair. The chair wants to ask me to address something. Okay. Um, so the answer is, I don't. I don't think that's what was said here today. What it was said is that there are these things we can do. Again, we have to look at the specifics as we go forward. Where so. there is a question. Right. Yes, yes Ms. Angela. <laughs> Thank you, Chair Barish. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, my a couple comments. One is uh, I, I really appreciate uh, having County Council Elliott here and the, uh, in her, uh, representation of the board action as far as as uh, allowing us to have her here as a as our council and also uh, what supervisor mccallan uh, was referring to i think is actually good news for the measure b committee um if you if you caught the full flavor of what he was saying i mean um, uh, chief counsel elliott is here because this committee really needs assistance with with uh, running a meeting that is Brown Act compliant. And so uh, Chief Counsel Elliott is here to really assist us with all things Brown Act. And any committee that's that's a Brown Act committee needs assistance with Brown Act compliance. So, you know, we're fortunate to have her here. Um, I do agree with Supervisor McCowan, though, that some of the questions are extremely technical. and. You know, you to have a, a generalist and then ask so many technical questions is is not always easy for that generalist to respond to. Clearly, nobody in here, and we have, we certainly have um, contractors here that are that are among us, and we have welders as well, <laughs> and, um, and still they can't answer these technical questions. So I think that the the offer that Supervisor McCowan just brought to the table on behalf of the board and Chief Counsel Elliott is that as we get into more technical issues, that Chief Elliott could bring in outside counsel for Measure B, and I, I don't want us to miss that, because I am of the opinion that we will need technical legal assistance, much more so than we have today. Um, I also think that we're in the weeds here, and you know these questions have been on the table for the last year, I understand that, but we're, we're in the weeds, and I think that um, Carol Hester's question about does this mean we can't do anything, no, it doesn't mean we can't do anything. What it means is that we need to begin to really look at what those options are that we want to do, and when we find those options that we absolutely think are the right path forward, then we figure out how we do that. You know, we're pretty much all over the board because there are so many opportunities, but at some point, I don't think we need to stick with you know, we can't do this because of this reason, or we can't do this, or, you know, really, at some point, we need to really decide as a committee what is the best course of action, whether it's a 24-hour psychiatric facility or whether it's crisis residential. And I think we, we have a, a key opportunity now. We have an attorney if we need one. We could get technical legal assistance if we need one. And so at what point can we actually start looking at what those recommendations are that we want to move forward to the Board of Supervisors. Thank you, Chair. And uh, I would like to echo what Ms. Angelo said about appreciating your support mm -hmm. and your being here and the Board of Supervisors for allowing it without charge to us. Um, moving on to item 3E, um, discussion of possible yes. action in the review of careful report as recommended by the Behavioral Health Advisory Board and adoption of recommendations contained therein. Um, I did receive an additional study guide this morning um, from Member Mabody that I'd like to pass out. It is um, a compilation of the previous two, so instead of having two, now you just have one complete guide. So, pass those out. I apologize for the
So, um, um, Chairman, um, no, it's different. Let me to leave this discussion thing. And I'll put the rest on the table back here. Okay. So, um, we spent a lot of money. Our committee actually asked that um, Mr. Kemper yes. do an analysis of our county and make recommendations, and we got that, but we haven't really looked at it. So the Behavioral Health Advisory Board has looked at it in depth, and so um, I thought it'd be good for our board too, because what we found was that some of the recommendations that were made were, were pretty general and vague. So um, I prepared the study guide to help us figure out how to approach it, because just randomly saying, oh, what do you think of the Kemp report was not productive. So there's like four parts to this. According to the recommendations that he made, there's a program and service, program services, there's um, action and policy, there's strategic financing plan, and then action, recommended action for the Board of Supervisors. The Board of, the Behavioral Health, Health Board only um, review the program services and the action and policy parts. So I thought it would be good for this board as well to go through it by line item. And the reason that I combined these was at first I thought, oh, well, we should think for ourselves. We shouldn't bother knowing what they did. But in case you want to see, they're side by side. Everything in yellow is what the Behavioral Health Advisory Board is recommending to the Board of Supervisors. And so then the blank one is for, um, for us, for our consultation. So the first item under program services was that there should be um, a psychiatric health facility or other inpatient psychiatric care created. And uh, the details were that um, a PUF unit is an average of three to five days. It's a maximum of 30 days. It's what's costing so much money out of county. So um, the Behavioral Health Board said, well, this, we talked about putting out an RFP for this, but the problem was that we didn't have enough information. We didn't know what the staffing was. We didn't know what the licensing requirements were, et, et cetera. So what we did was we suggested that we put out an RFI, which my techie person informed me is a request for information so that we would have all of this background information and could make an informed decision. So, what do you guys think? RFI to who? An RFI to somebody who can gather this information, maybe a, a consultant, I don't know. I mean, who would you put an RFP out to? RFP you would put out to a, a contractor or an institution that actually does this, that would be a request for proposal. After you already know what you want, right, right. yeah. That's, you know, uh, a request for information is asking for information from some specific body about what what is needed. I don't know if that's... Um, just resonating with what you're saying, I think, I mean, there are a lot of questions, like, for example, if we were to... Um, settle on the old Howard Hospital to to build the facility. There are a lot of questions. I mean, there have been objections brought up as to why that would not be a good facility to, to use. Uh, for example, uh, somebody from out of county, uh, when released, would walk out on the streets of Willits and, and could provide a liability for us in having to deal with them and to talk to another facility and find out the extent to which that actually happens. Uh, just that kind of information. Or um, one of the proposals, because the old Howard Hospital is too big for just a puff unit, there was a proposal for another locked unit for taking care of the, some of the conserved individuals from out of county. It would be very interesting to have a comparison of how much is being paid out of county versus how much we, we would save by having our own facility. But I think maybe these are the kinds of information you're talking about. Well, yeah, just general stuff on staffing and licensing and different ideas. It's hard to put out a request for a proposal unless you know what you want to do. Right. So that's a good question, though. Is well, who would you put that? Who would get that information? Who would spend the time to answer this? None of us. That's the point. None of the people either. There's no money there. 
I mean, if you get a request for proposal from somebody that is interested, I, my, my idea, and I've been thinking about this quite extensively, is advertise a request for proposal to see if anybody's interested to even run a pub, a pub facility. If we can't get a contractor to run it, then <laughs> what are we wasting our time for? <laughs> Yeah, why would we build it if we can't get a contractor to run it? Yes, but Chair Rush, I had two things. One is, you're right, um, Member Merkel, Merkel um, but when we do a, a in, and I'm looking at this whenever you talk about request for information, request for proposal, I see it as a counting process, which is extensive and very detailed, but um, this, would, this would go out to the public, and usually, depending on what the project is, we do have a list of uh, vendors or contractors that we refer to, but we could put out a, an RFP or an RFI, we could keep it out for 60 days until we get good responses. So I, I want to say that because just uh, as as the Behavioral Health Board has put this out, I'm sure that they're thinking also of counting processes and that's something that we could do. Um, but what, what I wanted to do was really step back. I appreciate this item coming forward from um, Member McGordy and Member Diamond, who hasn't said a word yet on this item, but oh, I have my hand up. Oh, okay, so but um, what I'm wondering is that we jumped right into the recommendations. So the, the item is to review the recommendations, and just is that, is that what we're going to do as a committee, so that we could then be clear if we are reviewing these recommendations that we actually have something that we that we make a decision. We're going to review and let's make a decision on each recommendation because my assumption is once we did that, that this is what we would move forward to the Board of Supervisors. So it's a question. Thank you. Mr. Bettman. Yeah, I, that, I was wanting a clarification as well about what, what this item is that we're, we're talking about and what the action is, what we're going to do. Because I had put in a request and you had put in a request that sounded like they were somewhat similar. My recommendation uh, had to do with a, a balance between what Sheriff Ahmed had said when this group first started. He said we've got to become a committee that doesn't just sit and talk about stuff and mm -hmm. talk and talk, but we act, number one. On the other side, we have to act in ways that when we recommend programs to the Board of Supervisors that they be well thought out and that they be recommended that we're going to be spent recommending spending of money. So we have to balance action and responsible decision making. And what Kit's pointing out, which is a third, is it has to be legal. You know, we have to recommend within guidelines that, you know, that, that, that meet the law. Um, so I had some specific, I'll just say what mine is, and I'm not sure exactly what you were having, wanting us to do today, but my, mine, I'll just say what it is and we can decide how to combine these. My recommendation was that we need guidance, and I think we're in agreement with this, about how do we proceed every meeting. It seems to me that part of the problem is we, we don't have a consistent method of moving ahead on decision making. So my recommendation, one, is that we accept the Kemper Report as a guidance for our moving ahead. And then secondly, that we have a small committee made up or appointed by our, our new, that each time would bring a recommendation for what priority programs from the Kemper Report we want to work on so that we would all know in advance, okay, this is the item that we're going to be looking at and we would stay with it to get whatever information we need so that we know if we're going to be talking about a puff, we know this is what we're going to talk about and that we would know that's the priority item we're going to talk about. We'd get whatever information we need and we would stick with it until we actually recommend a, uh, to the Board of Supervisors a specific recommendation for funding. Because otherwise, my experience is we bounce all around and each month we have a set of different ideas from different people and we, we spin our wheels a lot. Mm -hmm. So that was what I was hoping 
So I was going to put that in the form of a motion when we're ready for a decision about that, but I wasn't sure what you were asking, Jan, for us to do today with this. Well, my point was that we, we got a big packet from the Kemper Consulting Group. There were a number of recommendations. We haven't really read them as a committee to actually see what they are, let alone discuss them. And I would hesitate on assigning a committee to talk about like a PUF unit because it's something I think that the whole committee should be concerned with. I mean, perhaps the committee could get the information that's needed to talk about. But what I've observed here is that what we're hearing is people who come to us who want money to do something. And we're not looking at what was recommended that we consider. And that's, I think, what we should take time on. I mean, we can, this is easy to get through. It takes time. But I don't think it's something that we should avoid because we, in the past, have skipped all over the place because we haven't followed it for it. I, I think we're saying a similar thing is that, um, that to, we need a framework. And I think we, we're in, you and I are in agreement. I think the committee is that the Kemper Report is a good framework. I, I, the Kemper Report, we spent a lot of time on it. I've read it four times. I think everybody has read it. Um, well, I'm just telling you, I, I've read it four times. I can tell you that for sure. I feel like I understand it. I've read the recommendations, the priorities. And I think we would do well as a committee to accept the, the report as our guide. And then from that, I think we need to bring forth specific priorities, not that we would have a specific program, but if we, for instance, if the first priority was a PUF unit, that we would get whatever we need to make a decision on the PUF unit. Or if the next recommendation was the crisis residential treatment, we would know that's the next thing we're going to discuss. We would keep on that until we had a specific recommendation to the board. So I think that's similar to what you're saying. Yeah, I think that's right. Yeah. How do we go, how do we go forward? Yeah. So yes, uh, Ms. Angela. Chair Gersh, I, I, um, I'm, I'm going to jump in because I'm sitting here thinking both of you are saying the same thing. You're just going about it in a different way. You're basically saying that your recommendation out of this item and your name is on it is a recommendation that the Measure B Committee adopt the Kemper Report as a guideline or a guide moving forward to what we want to do. And, and Jan's component of that is going through those recommendations. So if we adopt, if the Measure B Committee decided to adopt the Kemper Report as a guide for moving forward, I would say I'm looking at our clerk and looking at our attorney, but the information is in here with both names on this item. That could be part of the uh, recommended action that the report is adopted as a guide. And as part of that, um, adoption of the Kemper report that the, we then would go through each recommendation with the intent of making a decision yes or no on that recommendation and then moving that recommendation forward. And I don't know about the committee, I think you two both have different ideas on having a committee, but it would seem that that might be the first step. That's right. Uh, thank you. I agree with the need for a, a guide, a strategic plan, whatever you call it. I think it's important for transparency for this committee so that there's a document that the public can refer to and know this is how they've prioritized the measure B money. These are the projects that will come forward. My question is really a clarification of the Behavioral Health Advisory Board's analysis. Um, in general, is, is the Behavioral Health Board's analysis consistent in terms of the prioritization of projects? Is it consistent with the Kemper report or does it diverge? Um, we did not set priorities. I just, we went through in the order that he had made his recommendations. Okay. And the only place where it got prioritized in his recommendations, my understanding is in the um, the action plan, the act, um, recommended action for the Board of Supervisors, which had and also I didn't point. Have financial. We didn't discuss that. Okay. We didn't discuss either of those. Yeah. Okay. 
Thank you. Can I have a motion regarding the uh, <laughs> <laughs> So just <laughs> close. <laughs> I can say. Just, just to reiterate that the recommended act, that, that the agenda item says discussion of possible action, including review of the Kemper report and adoption of recommendations contained therein. So the, the motion, um, there's, there's not a motion yet. The first action would be to review the report and then re adopt any key recommendations contained therein. So there's not a motion to be to be made at this point. Oh, well, so you're saying that this is to review the Kemper report? Correct. Today? Correct. Okay. <laughs> yes, I so I, I can see how we can shorten that, though. I mean, we can <laughs> summarize. Oh, look, there's four, four different sections of the Kemper report. Why don't we accept that as a guideline for uh, further study and action? I second that. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, mm -hmm. did Member McGordy want to walk us through the, through the report and recommendations? Yeah. Um, okay, so there's, there's four sections. There's his recommendation for program and services, changes. Two, three, four, five, six. Oh no! Uh, page six is the, his recommendation recommendations for action and policy, which were found on page forty-three of his report. And then there was the, his proposed strategic financing plan, which was found on page forty-four. And in this, it's uh, page seven and eight. And. Page nine is his recommended action for the Board of Supervisors, which was found on page 46 of his report. <coughs> so is that four seconds? Let me count. One, two, yeah, that's three. Four. The four sections. So we reviewed the outline of his recommendation. So, um, <laughs> med school was tough, huh? Was <laughs> there any discussion <laughs> regarding the uh, report by review? Um, is there any public comment regarding this item? <laughs> Moving on to. Oh, oh wait, wait, wait. wait. <laughs> oh, I'm sorry. Oh, I'm sorry. <clears throat> uh, John McCowan, uh, Board of Supervisors, and I, I do think following the Kemper report, using it as a, an outline uh, for decision making is an excellent suggestion. And I appreciate the work that uh, Jan McGordy and the Behavioral Health Advisory Board have done. However, in reviewing that, I think it should be in companion to the original Kemper report, which page uh, 43 is key policy decisions and recommended actions. 44, proposed Measure B strategic financing plan. And then 45, uh, he lays it out numerically what his recommendations are. And we do need the corrected version, which uh, includes the training facility, which uh, he originally left out of his uh, report, but I believe that he then reworked it to include that and revise some of the numbers. But I think uh, going through that uh, point by point, that, you know, that's a, uh, an outline that the committee could easily follow. And you know, first of all, take the items uh, as he's recommending. Uh, again, page 44, the proposed Major B strategic financing plan, he makes uh, specific recommendations, you could say, first, do you approve of it, of it in concept or not? And then, it, presuming you do, you can then drill down deeper into what does it cost, where should it be, et cetera. Uh, with regard to the expanded services, and I think that's pretty easy on the capital projects, with regard to the expanded services, the BHAB has made many specific recommendations, so I think holding those two together uh, you could actually move through this and uh, come to some decisions. Thank you. Okay. Uh, 
Well, I want to just make, if I can, just one comment about how I think we could proceed is if we accepted the Kemper Report as the guideline, the only addition I'm suggesting is that somebody or small group would each time, based on what we've accepted in the Kemper Report, would bring forth a specific priority that this group then could, you know, look at and then make a decision on, however long that would take. So, for instance, if we said that the item that we need to make the decision on is the PUF unit, that's the first most important thing that we need to address, or crisis residential, whatever the priority is, that would be brought before the committee so we would know next month that's what we're going to talk about, that's what we're going to discuss, that's what we will come to a decision and recommend to the board for funding so that we could keep things moving along and we could also, everybody would know in advance which priority we're going to address and that we would stay with it till we actually have a decision that we could recommend to the board so we don't go around and around. That's the only piece that I'm adding, I think, to what you're saying, is that somebody, I think, needs to do that to, to present to us, and so it is that all of us trying to do it together, and I think that's part of why, you know, if we're all making recommendations on what we're going to discuss, we spend a lot of time, and I think we, we get off track. So, Jim, I hear you recommending a format as to how we proceed in, in considering the temporary report. Is that right? Well, I mean, and I, I again, I, I'm not sure how we do it. I'm, well, I'm not sure there is. That's what I was. Well, yeah. Right. Yeah. Right. No, I don't think we did. I don't have a motion. It, it was a little. There was a second. No, there was a second. There was no motion. No, no motion. No motion. No motion. No motion. Well, I wouldn't take you anywhere. <laughs> well, I would like to make a motion. If again, I'm not sure. You'll have to tell me if it fits within the item as it's described. But my motion was to accept the Kemper report as a guideline for this committee to make recommendations for the board of supervisors on program priority and funding. That's my first motion. Can you repeat the last I have? Um, accept Kemper report as a guideline for this committee to make recommendations for the Board of Supervisors on, and I'm sorry, I lost you. Program priority and funding. Thank you. Okay, so now you lost for a second. So second. Yeah. <laughs> Is there a second? I'll, I will second it. I, I want to make sure that um, <coughs> accepting the Kemper report is exactly as uh, Jed said, is going to be a guideline. Kip report certainly um, doesn't agree with everything that I believe um, personally of the priorities of, of where the county needs to go. But as far as looking forward to the looking forward looking to it for guidelines and not by the strict following of the Kemp report, then that, that's what my second would be. Well, if the second would have to marry the motion. He said he used the word guideline, um, and I merely second it by stating the word guideline is a very important word in his motion. Okay, so you, you second his motion. I did. Thank you. <laughs> so put the guidelines in caps. Yeah. <laughs> Is there any further discussion? We have a pen. Oh, what? I'm sorry? The, the, oh, the, pen, the pen that means that someone wants to speak. Oh, I see. Okay. Yes. <laughs> So I, I I agree with uh, with with Tom and and I agree with with Jed and but but in terms of it being a guideline I, I believe no battle plan survives the first attack and uh, we're going to find out as we go forward that you know trying to follow that uh, the Kemper reports uh, strictly is going to be not not the best path I mean we'll and I don't even know where it's going to deviate but. I, I agree. It'd be a good guideline, but it's a guideline, and uh, we already found some issues with some a lot of the, the funding numbers for the brick and mortar uh, that were just you know they were wishful thinking at best. So we're going to find a lot of problems with it, but having it as a guideline because we need some kind of guideline, right? I mean, I I, I agree. I believe it a guideline and not a roadmap. There you go. I like that. That's good. 
<laughs> yeah, I, I, that's that's my two cents. Oh, sorry. Oh, I'm sorry. sorry. I didn't need oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> I, yes, yeah, okay. Um, <clears throat> I would like to uh, support that uh, that uh, we go ahead and use the Kemper report as a guideline only. Uh, I too am. Um, uh, concerned about some of the prioritization in there and some of the financial aspects of it that I think we need to really discuss and, and elaborate on. Um, but we do need organization and we need um, a direction here and if we can follow these recommendations I think that will, uh, that will speed this up a little bit for this committee. Any other further comment? You've changed. Oh, okay. Yes, Miss Angela. Can you please repeat the motion? Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Um, the motion by Member Diamond was accept Kemper Report as a guideline for this committee to make recommendations for the Board of Supervisors on program priorities and funding. Does that motion include that we actually review the recommendations? Because I'm, I'm assuming that. that we want to review the recommendation. We're going to use this as a guide. I'm thinking we're going to review the recommendations to move those recommendations forward or not. Is that part of the motion or not? Would you like to amend your motion to include that or clarify? Well, my, my clarification is we've been reviewing my, my again, my said we've been reviewing them and, and it's reviewed. Part of my reasoning for having a small subcommittee or group to then bring forth specific priority areas for full discussion by the committee is so that we could then drill down into that, take the specific priorities that we feel are most important, and then bring them to the, the full committee for discussion and ultimately recommendations of the board. So I, I think we've done that is what I'm saying. I don't think we need to take another month to do more review. Dan, um, I, I beg to differ. I don't think that we have reviewed them in depth. We've said, oh, you know, here's a Kemper report and everybody read it, but that's not really reviewing this recommendation. In, uh, I think it's important that we read it together and see what they are. It's, I know you've read it four times. I mean, I read it four times and it was really difficult. You know, I mean, I had to take a break during each of the four times because it's so complex. I agree. So, we, you know, reviewing it is different from studying it when we're actually looking at his recommendations. And I think, yes, we could break it down, you know, because there were four sections of recommendations, but I think it's important that we look at what his recommendations are. Using it as a template, not a roadmap, because the bird's path is more direct. Right? I'll, I'll cut to the chase here. Jan McGordy, um told the Board of Supervisors that she doesn't believe that every me panel member has read the Kemper report. And so um, I, I hate to be very blunt with everybody, but um, if you haven't read the Kemper report, maybe you could raise your hand because I, in my heart, I believe everybody's read it. No, I said that they, we had not studied it yet. Right, that's not the word I heard. But um, I, I'm asking each member to to read, if you haven't read it, to, to read it. Even I read it. <laughs> but actually, I think what she's saying is we didn't like collectively together. I understand. We need it. two hours a month, <laughs> and if we review this, then we all need to block off forty hours for the month of February and sit down and go page by page. And I know everybody here, and I and everybody here actually has busy parts of their life where they can't do that. So the responsibility of us being on this committee. It includes the responsibility of reviewing what we paid a lot of money for mm -hmm. and um, not making accusations that we haven't read it because I believe everybody's read it. So um, there doesn't need to be a, an addition that we're going to review it because we've read it. And if you haven't read it, please read it. We have a motion in a second. Uh, any, how the comment on, on this item? Yeah, John Hashtag, Board of Supervisors. Um, I attended the Behavioral Health Advisory Board uh, meeting the other day, and I, I've looked at these recommendations, or it's kind of like delineating what the Kemper recommendations are, 
And um, it seems like everyone on this committee has an understanding of what's going on. And probably everyone has a, an opinion about what is the highest priority. And just going back to my days as a teacher, is that if we went around this room and said, what's your number one priority? We could probably get some kind of agreement to move forward and to start laying out a plan. If you go, okay, we can see that, you know, puff unit is everyone's number one or a CRT or whatever it is, then um, we could move forward like that. Just an idea. So we have a motion and a second on the table. So are we ready for a vote? So you go right here. Right, that's what I do. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so I'm going to repeat the motion so that everybody's clear what the motion is. The motion is by Member Diamond, seconded by Sheriff Holman, to accept Kemper Report as a guideline for this committee to make recommendations for the Board of Supervisors on program priorities and funding. Um, and I will assume that the maker of the motion votes yes. Yes. Sheriff Holman? Yes. Member Riley? Yes. Mr. Myrtle? Yes. Ms. Muschietti? Yes. Chair Rash? Yes. Excuse me. Um, member Weir? Yes. Yeah, something in my nose there. Um, member Liberty? Yes. CEO Angelo? Um, I, I'm going to vote, but before you, I just want to make one comment, which is, that whichever way this motion goes, I think that it affords us the opportunity to move forward with some action. And I think that might have been the point that Member McGordy had and, and the Behavioral Health Board of going through the recommendations one by one so that we actually saw what was in front of us and were able to take action on those recommendations. And with that said, I'm going to vote this. Member McGordy. A brief after the fact comment, John McCowan. I do believe my colleague uh, made an excellent suggestion, and if you would simply as an exercise go around and name this is what I believe the number one priority is. After you've gone around, I think you will have identified probably the two top, two or three top priorities that would help focus your discussion and possibly lead to action. Start on that side of the room. Yes. Yeah, so, <laughs> does, does that need to be in the agenda? No. 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 It does not. Yeah. So. Uh, what, okay. Does work? Uh, yeah. There's a lot of things. Yeah. Anyway. Uh, why don't we do that then, Jen? What's the What's so, the question? So, <laughs> uh, Mr. McCowan would like to know what you, you identify as the top priority, uh, top uh, priority in the. You know, you would like to see sure. I, I mean, I can say mine. Oh, you know. I'm sorry. No. Go ahead. Yeah, I'd say mine quickly. Uh, there are two. I think the, the the puff unit is my top priority, or a residential. But I think that will take a long time, maybe, to get a decision. So I think the most immediate is the crisis residential. So I would put those together and work on them together. Thank you for the question. Um, I, as a person who collected the vast majority of signatures for Measure AG and requested the Board of Supervisors put Measure B on the ballot, I um, have been in every part of this county talking to citizens and talking to professionals. And without a doubt, my number one priority is a psychiatric health facility for the purpose of allowing hospitals to hopefully reduce their um, overcrowding and to allow our law enforcement officers to get back out on the street as quick as possible to do other jobs. Thank you for the question. Uh, I'm a little uncomfortable with this exercise because although I have read the report numerous times, the acronyms I still have to <laughs> refer to the glossary that I made. And so um, I'm just going to speak in very general terms, but I agree in concept with the Kepper report. Um, 
the problem is that we've talked about some of these things um, as a combined effort, a, a CRT and a CSU as a combined effort. So to say that I'm prioritizing one and not the other um, potentially discredits the fact that they could be co-located. So the top three priorities, I agree, are a crisis residential treatment center, um, a PUF unit, and a crisis stabilization um, unit in general. I don't quite understand what you mean by, uh, what was the word you used, if they're co-located? Co-located. Yeah, so what was the, what was your objection? That you couldn't, if, if they're going to be in the same facility, right. it just seems like that would lend more weight to, you know, if they're top two recommendations. Those are my top three recommendations, okay. and mm -hmm. one or more of them may be co-located. Okay, very good. Mr. Merlin. Uh, my top recommendation is to add some cohesion in the mental health um, situation. The more I study it, the more I realize why there's so many problems, because everything is siloed, and there's really no synergy between any of them. So um, I think there needs to be services that bridge those silos. Um, I think those are very important keys. I think um, from my um, communications with others in the, the uh, uh, other stakeholders in this, this situation that we need crisis stabilization, we need crisis residential, we need a puff unit. I think we need all of those. And uh, I think those are all equal and that's why I think working together on those to bring the money aspect to the table is important. So putting things in priority without studying them all is going to leave one out. So without putting a, a financial aspect to each of these important things that Measure D was put on the back for, um, we might not be doing our due diligence. So the priority that I'm saying is CRT, CSU, buff unit, and services. <laughs> yes. And that's my exact, my exact, sorry, I'm jumping ahead. Mine is prevention, puff, aftercare, and they all need to go together. All of them. Okay, rather than questioning, I will you know, I will respond and also add mine. Um, I, I like your comment. I, I completely agree. I mean, I think I think the silos are a big problem, and I think that we have to have a general overview as to how this is going to happen and connect the dots without uh, without acting on priorities, as you say, without without seeing that the extent to which it's all connected. That being said, um, as we talk and as we have talked over a long period of time, the problem continues. And I, I, uh, from the beginning, I've been somewhat impatient about doing something about the problem, the problem being overload of the hospitals, of the sheriff's department, but most of all of the suffering individuals that really don't have um, much recourse. Um, I think that there's there is a there's some infrastructure that's there already that helps. Uh, I would at least like to see some organized effort for people who are uh, who are in crisis. Um, you know, certainly the infrastructure is a much larger affair, but also has to be considered at the same time. And as Dr. Trotter said at the beginning, I would like to see us consider the low hanging fruit. Uh, and that being so, as, as to the, the, because of the fact that the staffing is less complex, the price is cheaper, the completion, is, the, 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 the location is decided, the completion date would be the most uh, straightforward and, and, and the earliest. Um, and so, given that, I, uh, I would like to see the project proceed on Orchard Avenue. Uh, as soon as possible, which is which is going to be discussed a little further on the next item, 
Um, and uh, then as that's happening, and we have a place to, and, I, and again, I think that the crisis stabilization unit will do to some extent what the Huff unit can do, and that is that the, the sheriff's department can take a, an individual through the crisis stabilization and not have to stay there with the individual. That we have a locked unit at least for temporary use, and um, uh, and the, the instead of going to the emergency department for extended periods of time, they can go to the crisis stabilization and hopefully step down quickly to the crisis residential. Um, so, um, but and, and so that is what I identify that that specific building is what I identify as my top priority. Yes. Can I just clarify what I said? Yes. For those of us who have gone through it, there really isn't a priority. Prevention is huge. The first step is huge. If that fails, the PUF unit, it's huge to have it here. And when you've been in a PUF unit, you need aftercare. For those of us who have been through it, there is no priorities. They all have to be there. And that's all I want to say. Mr. Weir. Yeah, um, I believe um, the important priority is um, a tough unit, and uh, after that, the crisis residential and the crisis stabilization facilities. Um, and then I would add a training facility. I think in Measure B, it's very clear that these facilities are 75% of the funding. I believe if you're going to put that much responsibility on the funding, that's where our focus needs to be. Um, I know I know services are important. 25% um, of the money is for services. Um, remember that after five years, this measure drops down to an eighth of a cent, which leaves us with a limited amount of money for services. So I'm, I'm afraid if we focus everything up front on services, We'll get down the line and find out maybe in the sixth year, seventh year, we cannot afford to go forward with them. And we'll have to turn to the county for that funding. So I want to stay focused on the, the facilities and the construction and or development of them. With the 75% of the funding, I think that should be the, my part of it. So actually, I agree with a little bit of everything everybody said. I think that uh, uh, prevention is, is big. I think that uh, we kind of, uh, we address that at least partially with the MOPS program. I think that's uh, worth keeping an eye on. So um, we actually did do something um, that we, that that maybe we grow that because that seems like that's a really uh, early, uh, early warning kind of sign. Uh, then, uh, you know, I think we have a pretty clear path. I think also the, the uh, Kemper report, um, one of the top things they listed was uh, the crisis residential and the, what, you know, the thing that Camino wants to do. Uh, I think that's, um, there's a clear, pretty clear path to that. Um, so I'd kind of be interested in, in chasing that down. Although I, I gotta tell you today, I thought, I had a good understanding of you can't design build and, and Mark indicates that I'm, I'm not right on that. And, and I, I think we need some clarity on that. And, and I'm, because one of the motions is to go off for a biddable designs. Well, that's going to preclude a design build situation, I would think, right, if we do that. And, and just to give people a sense of this, we're going to go out and do a, a design, a, a, a bit, look for a biddable design. You're, you're talking just for the design, just for the design, you're talking close to a million bucks. It's very expensive, it's very expensive. We have to be very careful about the, about that. Um, so, anyways, those are the things I'd say. The crisis residential, the, the path, there's a there's a path there, it's, a, it's not quite as straight, I think. And, and then I, I think what we did with the, the MOPS was a good, a good preventative care measure. I guess. Could I have a little clarification about, you know, how you see things changing with design versus design build at that point, right? I thought you couldn't do design build, the designer and the builder, they have to be separate because there's conflicts if they're the same. 
And, and Mark saying he disagrees with me, and I, I, I have to listen to that because he, he's in that business. I'm, I'm a, a re very reluctant developer of late, and, and I'm learning a little bit about this, but I don't have his experience. He can't make mufflers really good, and I don't know much about building really good. So, so I, I have to listen to that. I have to listen to that. If you need a muffler. So, um, the Kemper report on page 40 says, our assessment of Mendocino County's current mental health service continuum is that it does not offer a robust set of alternative services that create crisis conditions, that prevent crisis conditions and provide alternatives to inpatient psychiatric care. The system is heavily tilted toward responding to crisis conditions with the primary service strategy of inpatient psychiatric care in out-of-county facilities. But the one line I like the best in this whole Kemper report is this one. Measure B funding is to reduce the need for inpatient psychiatric care while simultaneously assuring that inpatient psychiatric care is available in the county when needed. And I think that speaks to what, maybe what we really should be doing. And I support what the sheriff is saying. And if, if Sheriff Allman didn't, look, didn't do the work that he did, none of us would be sitting here. And for that, I personally thank you. Mm -hmm. I think that um, when I started here in 2007, we didn't talk about it, but our mental health staff actually had a 23-hour crisis stabilization. And some of you might remember that. And I remember our staff, and this might have not been legal, and I don't know. I just said it's brand new. But I remember our mental health staff walking people around the building, and I see Camille shaking her head. So after 23 hours or 22 and a half hours, they would take somebody out, they would release them, they would walk them around the building, and after midnight, they would bring them back. And that was a 23-hour crisis stabilization unit, but it wasn't called that. And I believe that what they did, and under that mental health director at the time, who, by the way, I had a lot of problems with, because I didn't know what he was doing and I didn't understand what he was doing. But I understand today because I sit here. But what he was doing was actually keeping people in the county and keeping them out of jail and keeping them out of a 24-hour psychiatric facility. And that went away. And so where we are today, I see the only decisions are, do we jump in full boat on a 24-hour psychiatric facility? Do we look at a crisis residential? Do we look at a crisis stabilization? And when I think about what actually could support the system and keep people out of jail and keep them out of the hospital ERs and keep them out of a 24-hour psychiatric facility outside of Mendocino <coughs> County, it seems to me that a crisis stabilization unit would be the number one priority, whether it is or not for this committee. It would seem to me that we would look at that. I also think that with a 24-hour psychiatric facility, there are multiple reasons why they fail. And my understanding of why Mendocino County's 24-hour psychiatric facility failed was one, we didn't have money, two, we didn't have staff. I don't know why it failed. But what I do know when I read this report four times is that if we do not have the support services for clients, that 24-hour psychiatric facility will not survive. And whether it's because there will be no more money or whether it was that we will not be able to get staff up here because you try to find a nurse up here, whatever, we're going to have a tough time with that 24-hour psychiatric facility. It would seem to me that we could jump into a crisis stabilization unit and that that could provide support. Thank you. Your turn. <laughs> Um, I think our priority, um, because of the outlines and the, the um, support for Measure B, was some kind of psychiatric facility. However, I think the priority should be to find out all the information we can about the different psychiatric facilities and their staffing needs, etc., before we can make an educated decision. So. That would be my highest priority, would be to gather that information about psych facilities. Thank you. Ms. Miller, Dr. Miller. 
So I would say um, I was here in that time, Carmel, that you spoke about, that we um, kept people overnight on the old... 23 hours. I never said yeah. we kept them overnight. No. Well, <laughs> sometimes they came in late. So 23 hours can be a night, right? <laughs> Someone comes in at 5 o'clock at night, and you keep them for 23 hours uh, from that 5 o'clock at night. So it was, and, you know, we did keep them 23 hours, and we did walk them around the building sometimes. Oh, good. But, um, <laughs> and um, this is all on Kim. <laughs> but it was 23 hours. I want to say it was 23 hours, and but people come in at all hours is what I say. There are people that come in at 12 o'clock, maybe that type of um, option. And I can say we did um, reduce hospitalizations. We had several people by just giving them 23 hours that we were able to stabilize and be able to send help. And that was a point where law enforcement would bring them directly to us and drop them off at the crisis unit and we would take them and decide from there whether we were going to 5150 them or not and bring them into, over to the hospital if it was safe to do so. So with that said, I think that um, some of my, uh, my priority is really looking at a CSU and a CRT would be my top choices. I think that prevention would be my first thing to look at. Um, being able to have a CSU and a CR or and or CRT would uh, really help us in reducing costs. Thank you very much. Um, is there any public? I, I don't know if this, this wasn't really an agenda. I'm still the same item. Yeah. I'm still the same item. It's, this is item uh, three. Uh, is there any, I guess, is there any further public comment? Good afternoon, Camille Schrader with RQMC. Um, I just wanted to reiterate, um, regardless of how it is formed or built or whatever agreements occur, the reason that the project on Orchard started and exists as a very complicated option is that Education has already been done. Science research already has proven. Everyone, literally the numbers, the data, all of the information shows that for the clients, for the people suffering on, in the streets, for law enforcement and for the ERs, crisis residential and crisis stabilization will reduce by a third, if not 50%. We've always said conservatively a third because we want to be conservative in the expectations. It's absolutely known that it will, and it could not work unless we had an in-county psychiatric facility so that we can move them, you know, swiftly if they need it longer. Um, that's no, that's the reason the project was begun and, and started. The reason this particular project was um, crisis stabilization, crisis, stabil uh, crisis residential and access is for the purpose that um, Ms. Angelo said, which is we're going to have a tremendous issue with workforce and you want to share workforce and share finances and share sort of the, the work that goes into those three components. And if they're together on the same site, you have the opportunity to be able to use your expertise where it's needed most. So I just want to be clear about that. And uh, again, however it gets done, we just need that for our clients. So thank you. Thank you. So moving on to measure item three cap, which is a nice segue. Uh, my intention for uh, formulating this with the help of uh, Ross, Ross and I had spent quite a uh, quite a while talking about this, uh, is uh, with the hopes of moving forward <coughs> on the crisis residential crisis stabilization, crisis access. Uh, although, and I don't, maybe this is uh, one of the places where it's nice to have uh, counsel available, but uh, um, this is sort of a complicated item being as it was already proposed, uh, RQMS thought they had the funding and then, and then due to a technicality lost most of it. Uh, and so that's the reason they're trying to measure B. However, it was already approved by the Board of Supervisors. So um, I think that ultimately what we are, what our job is, is, is to decide whether we approve of using Measure B funding for that project. So this is where it's difficult. Now, uh, I am not sophisticated in building loss, and certainly a lot more than I am, and what he suggested was that we move forward with putting out an RFP for a uh, biddable design, because we don't know, and again, this is not something I'm sophisticated in, 
we don't know how much this is going to cost, and we can't really responsibly vote on it without knowing what we're talking about. Um, um, that being said, I'm not 100% sure that that's in our purview. I'm, I'm just not sure. But, you know, I, I would, um, Ross, Ross does think so, and so I'm, and I respect what he has to say. So, um, now after having had that discussion that we had, I'm not sure that this is, I mean, you yourself was suggesting maybe this is no longer the best way to go because it's not design build. And then the second issue is the fact that this was already planned uh, and, and approved by the board. Um, and I'm not, you know, I'm not quite sure if we could approve use of measure funding pending an acceptable um, an acceptable bid that would probably have to depend on design, like you say. So, uh, I'm sorry. I was just kind of curious as I yeah. put his take on so, it. Even though you can put a project out for design build, you're limited it to very few contractors, which may in this course not be the best path because there's many local contractors that could bid this work competitively that are capable of designing and bidding it competitively. In the event of uh, you know, tens of millions of dollars you get more interest in that in a smaller project like this you, you don't so I think in this you know if we were to proceed down this path for a CSU CRT I think sending it out for a biddable design is the right avenue to do and then you're opening it up for anyone that wants to design a project anywhere not just on Orchard Avenue does Orchard Avenue have a leg up? Absolutely. <laughs> but if someone wants to build something somewhere else, then so, uh, that's what that's the way I read this. It's not specific to Orchard <coughs> Avenue. Right. Mm -hmm. Kind of Valley. Right. Um, with that, in Jan's study guide here, it's one of the, the second most important thing that they want is a crisis stabilization and crisis residential facility in Fort Bragg. So, um, well, they could build it in Fort Bragg, but 25% of the population per the Kemper report comes from Fort Bragg, and 75% comes from Ukiah. So, I agree wholeheartedly that we should have one over there. I don't think we can afford one, or afford two of them. And, um, you know, per RQMC's um, design that they gave us to operate the facility, we're, they're expecting Measure B to provide $500,000 a year in service funding. So, um, that and the existing MOPS program that we've already obtained, we've spent half of the operating funds. Mm. Mr. McCallum, would you like to make any comment? <laughs> uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, John McCallum, so with respect to the issue of design build, that's what, what's in front of you right now. I, I think uh, Member Myrtle made an excellent suggestion that design build would probably disadvantage local contractors. So maybe it makes sense to split it, but uh, really it's, this is your decision. We just uh, welcome you bringing something forward. I'm sorry, Mr. Liberty. So this has got a lot of arms and legs, got kind of complicated. One of the issues is um, that the 
probably the odds on favor for being the operator is RCS, uh, obviously. And, and RCS actually owns a design, right? You guys already went down the path of, of doing a design. Yeah, full disclosure, we, we talked a little bit yesterday. So, so this isn't actually set up, but it, we did talk. Um, they, they own a design. I think if the, the kind of odds on favor for being the operator uh, has a, a recommended design, that, that should probably be something we'd want to look at, but they own the intellectual property. And so we, we would have to ask that that be uh, available. And, and uh, as, as part of using that to go out for a biddable design, if we're going to use that, we can't do that without their blessing. So we have to understand that. Right. And I'm not an IT attorney, but I'm pretty sure that you guys own the intellectual property and that we can't use that. And actually, Mark, you have an understanding of that, right? That they have a design, they have a rough design. That right. is that not available? I don't think that's property of ours. It's theirs. Right. Right. So, so we I don't have think to get we can advertise with that design. We probably have to get your permission to use it. But um, I don't think we need that design. We can say we want this many square feet with this type of rooms, this type of, and we can detail that out, that this is what we want, how much is it to design it and build it. I don't know who's gonna do that, but. <laughs> <laughs> so that's, a, that's the problem, right? Who's right. gonna be able to, they've got a, a started design. So we have to consider that. If we're gonna go out for a biddable design, and also beware again, if we ask for a biddable design, we're talking, you know, close to a million dollars for the design itself, for the, the, the paperwork. And with that in mind, um, would whoever makes this motion uh, be okay with just dropping the last four words in the UKI about? The motion is going to be for a building uh, that's going to adequately serve our needs. Yeah, probably the design, the biddable design wouldn't be really specific to a geographical area. I mean, it does change a little bit of, you know, you have this cross street or that cross street, you know, where you're at, but, but yeah, generally speaking. It's not my, I, you, it's your agenda item, so. Well, I have no motion yet. It could be anywhere, right? It doesn't have to design that is not a geographic specific. But I just, but I there, understand, I just want to understand why would you want to do that? I mean, what does it the mean? elephant in the room is there's always talk of old Howard Hospital, and if a company said, oh, if a company said, I can I can design that with the Howard Foundation and I can meet your criteria, we we haven't asked anybody to do that. Or if, if we put it out there without those words, nobody responds with old Howard Hospital. That answers a lot of questions. So you're talk, you're talking about not a pump unit but a crisis residential no, crisis. That's not what I'm talking. I'm talking about putting the bid out as. 3F says, and not saying in the Ukiah Valley, and it would it would serve the purposes of what that motion or that item is. Okay, so I think we had a square footage estimate on the on the motion. On the thing, right? No, on the, the, uh, on the motion. On the motion? No, you no, not. Not on the motion. We have a motion, yet, but on the no. agenda item now. So, I'm sorry, Ms. Gregory. Yeah, um, yes, I have a question uh, regarding um, venue, and I know that the two places that we talk about over and over and over are Orchard Avenue with RCS and Howard Hospital with the Howard Foundation. But you know, the county has a building that used to be a hospital. This one used to be a hospital. Why are we not considering the site on Dora Street? I mean, it's already built. It was a hospital. It has large corridors. It has locked doors. Is it a potential? Is it a possibility? I, I, I think we're limiting ourselves when we say, oh, we need to look at this for this. Well, that's why I'm saying if we drop those four words, it could be any of those. Yeah. So, I mean, just on bringing it up earlier, that's why. <laughs> <laughs> it's, uh, uh, excuse me, it's Chicago Park. Can I respond to what she said? Of course. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, yeah, thank you. I, I, did, I thought you were directly. But, no. <laughs> but um, she's part of the We did consider uh, uh, the old. Who's we? Not in this group. Not this group. But, right. But, but we there was some consideration of the old general hospital uh, as a use as a crisis stabilization, um, and I can't remember what the issues were that directed us away from it. Well, um, then it would be good to revisit it. Yeah. 
Okay, well. Also, you can get a portable and flop it on a place, which is what we were thinking for Fort Bragg, which might be a whole lot cheaper than, you know, hiring an individual design firm and building and constructing it. All right, uh, Ms. Angela. Uh, so, you know, uh, with all due respect to this committee that I sit on, and all due respect to my great friend and colleague, <laughs> Member Liberty, that we're, we're back, we're so into the weeds, we can't make a decision. We are so into the weeds. And, you know, I realize, because we have some, some uh, really competent fiscal people on this committee who really want to watch the money, because that is the number one job of this committee, is watching the Measure B funds, how they're spent, and that we're good stewards of the, of the public's money. But I guess when I look at this, and I and, you know, we've been all through this, and it, it's biddable design, and then you talk about a million dollars for a biddable design and all this, you know, was the decision made? What was the decision made that we even want to, to start with a crisis residential and crisis stabilization? I mean, right now we're talking about a biddable design. And so I guess what I would, would another approach, which really may not be what this committee wants to do, but another approach is that you make a recommendation to the board that they move forward, that the Measure B committee wants us to move, wants the board to move forward with the um, research, whatever you want to call it, with a crisis stabilization and a crisis residential unit. And then we get into a, a county contracting and purchasing process. And my deputy is here who can speak to that. But, you know, I think we're going to sit here. It's a quarter to three. We're going to sit here and we're going to go back and forth with this biddable design. And I don't know that we're going to make a decision. And I don't know that this committee has even made a decision that you even want to move forward with crisis stabilization or crisis residential. So, um, so I have a real issue with that. It's like, it, what do we want to move forward with? And if it is crisis stabilization and crisis residential, then why can't the Measure B Committee just make a recommendation to the board to move forward with, with those two services? I very much appreciate your comment, and this is my intent. I would like to move forward as fast as possible. And if and to, to expedite the facility on Orchard Avenue. Um, and, uh, and as I said, the board had already approved it, so if we can uh, commission the board to, well, commission the board, make, a, make a recommendation to the board to, um, uh, to proceed with an acceptable facility, I'm all for that. And in that, and I know that's not the agenda item, so I would, yeah. Oh, that's okay. 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 Let's not stay there, please. No, no I apologize. I'm making that's okay. I'm just listening intently. Okay. okay. So, <laughs> it looked like you wanted to speak. Sorry. She so, did. <laughs> if there's a more expeditious pathway to proceeding with this, that's what I would be for. And in the service of that, I would withdraw my agenda item if I can do that. And. Um, <laughs> uh, no. no, so no, I, no I, motion. we don't have to have a yeah. but we haven't had a motion. Either. No, yeah. but uh, okay, so yeah. so I would uh, then then um, then would you like to make a motion? Uh -huh. Me? No. <laughs> so, so, you know, I, under usual circumstances, um, the the oh this is this was yours. Yes. yes. I'm thinking it was yes. it was Otherwise, Ross's. it would be the percentage. I, yeah, I will make a motion. I don't know if it's going to go anywhere, but I will make a motion. I'm going to revise this to say um, that uh, the Measure B Committee makes a recommendation to the Mendocino County Board of Supervisors to explore utilizing uh, Measure B funds for the development of a crisis stabilization and crisis residential unit. Okay, I second. If I can. She says, uh, go. He says, what I got. What's that? Yeah, well, like, exactly. And, and please be aware that the motion that I made is that we recommend to the board, because it's right. the board that makes the decision, right. it's not us, right. that we recommend to the board 
that they, they begin the process of researching doing a crisis stabilization and a crisis residential unit. I mean, that's, that's all we're recommending. And we're basically saying that those are top priorities for Measure B services. Which was demonstrated by the around the room. But and now it's, it's yes. you're going to so, go around again and so do, is there any does, is there any uh, is there any weight carried by the fact that the board already approved the project? Only if it's uh, something that the Measure B committee members appreciate or not. Okay. Right. And I don't know, Ms. Elliott, if you have any comment or not. No, There's exactly. a lot of pens up. Can you second? No, we had a second. He second. Can he second it? No, that's what I was going to say. As a point of order, you need to pass the gavel to your vice chair in order to second that motion. Would you like to do that? I second. Okay. Great. Is there any discussion? Okay. Please, I think there's I got pens. I got pens. So, point of order also. Once you pass the gavel, she's now the chair. I'm now the chair. 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 <laughs> Thanks a lot. No, I'm learning. I'm learning. You lost your gavel. <laughs> you had your pin up, sir. So, I, I do agree that crisis stabilization, crisis uh, residential treatment is 100% um, necessary. Um, I, I'm, I'm in support of researching. Um, you know. The financial costs of, of building that to see if that fits into my mission of affording everything. So, um, so I am in total support of that, and the stakeholders that I have represent absolutely 100% say we need crisis stabilization and crisis residential treatment. So that's all I have to say. Thank you, Mr. Liberty. Or was your, were you? I, I didn't pay attention to who was up first because I didn't know I was going to be chair. <laughs> yeah, Mr. Liberty, your turn. Yeah, I, I, I'm just a little curious. I, what could possibly have been approved if the board approved something? I don't. I, and I want to get my head around that. So we're going to make a recommendation to the board, but it's just going to say uh, we want this crisis, uh, a crisis residential center someplace. That's as broad. That's how broad we're, our make a, our recommendation is right now. And if there was a, something that was approved, I can't even imagine what that could be. Because if there was something approved, there was an estimate on the table. There was an estimate. There wasn't a biddable design. There was an estimate. They, I can't imagine they approved that. Do you mind if I ask for clarification from us? It, it could go 2x. It could you go 2x. You don't want to clarify? Okay. <laughs> oh wait. See, I knew I'd get him up there. Well, that I mean, really is your role to make the recommendations. I think as much detail as you can add would be appreciated by the board because I do believe that's uh, what we're looking for. But really, it's it's for this board to make the recommendations that that you're comfortable making. Do you mind just clarifying? My understanding, just you can just tell me if this is correct, is that the board um, approved the building on Orchard Avenue by by our uh, our QMS uh, in the past. The board we, supported a grant application, is my recollection. Uh, I so that uh, was not funded. It oh, it's in the packet apparently, and it is. Am I giving the gist of it? <laughs> and so, but that ship has sailed as of now, I believe. Otherwise, you wouldn't need to discuss this. It would be out there, presumably, getting built. Um, I think the motion is very broad, and uh, it doesn't provide a lot of guidance for the Board of Supervisors. Um, but, you know, I don't want to be in the position of telling you what to do. Um, so I was going to ask a comment. Oh, I'm sorry. Ms. Tammy? Please. Tammy Moss-Chandler, Director of Health and Human Services. Uh, just to further add to Supervisor McCowan's comments, uh, in your board packet today is actually the history of all the Board of Supervisors' approvals. What you'll see in those agenda summaries that are attached is what Supervisor McCowan stated that there was an application that started several years ago to the state of California 
Uh, it's referenced uh, as both Senate Bill 82, which is the same as the Mental Health Wellness Act of 2013. And that funding is actually uh, provided through an organization called CHFFA at the state level. And uh, you can actually go online and see the agreements that tie to this. It was an agreement to give the initial funding with the expectation that additional funding would be leveraged. That actual funding to purchase the land on Orchard Street for $380,000 was uh, completed between the county and Redwood Community Services, RCS, in uh, the spring of 2017 with an expectation over the next 12 months, which would have been by June 2018, that additional funding sources would be secured for that building. There was actually a CDBG application that went forward and uh, was not successfully awarded. There was discussion of USDA loan funding that didn't move forward. So that's why we're here today. All that's been secured is the purchase of a piece of land on Orchard for $380,000 and the remaining uh, strategy to build is currently uh, in a limbo, if you will. And so that's all that's been uh, done. There's no building, there's no facility, there's no facility started. Uh, there was some initial work put in to put it forward the CDBG proposal, and I'm sure Dan Anderson could add to that, but that's where the county is today. Thank you. Jan, I'm still chair. Your, your motion's on the floor. <laughs> <laughs> oh man, you watch out for Donnie, you guys put it in. Um, I like that it's vague so that we have the opportunity to look at other venues because I know there's a lot of pressure on Orchard Avenue, but I think unless we look at all the options, we're not doing a good job. Shannon. Uh, just a clarifying question. Do we know if there are covenant restrictions on the Orchard Avenue property associated with a crisis residential treatment? Uh, through the Please. chair with now Ms. Yeah. Ms. Uh, so uh, Dan Anderson is with uh, Redwood Community Services and uh, the, currently we are working through the, the deed and grant processes with the state and can speak further to what the covenants are. That's it. Yeah, there aren't, there aren't any current covenants that That's we're aware of. But we do, excuse Yes, sorry Dan. Dan Anderson with RCS. Uh, we are in the process of establishing some, uh, a lease agreement with encumbrances on the property, but uh, Depending on where this goes, there are timelines on that, so we may need to shift. You know, if if, if it goes somewhere else, which is fine, uh, but that 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 probably is the most significant and you know thing. But it's not actually formal. It's in our agreement with Chapa. Yeah. And that that agreement with Chapa, the state organization, uh, has not been um, uh, executed to date. Oh, <laughs> I'd like to revise that motion. Can I say what I'd like to revise it to? Please. Please. <laughs> that was good, Carla. This is for supervising the county. So, um, the motion was, could you read the original motion, please? Yes, um, the motion was that Measure B Committee make a recommendation to the Mendocino County Board of Supervisors to explore utilizing Measure B funds for the development of a crisis stabilization and crisis residential facility. Further, uh, that the Board of Supervisors direct staff to research options associated with the development of said facility, including design, build, uh, bid, build, Design, bid, build, and potential property or facility locations. Now, if that isn't governmental state, I don't know what it is. I'm sorry, but basically, I can, I'll send it to you. But basically, what I'm saying is that if I believe the motion should be broad because I think it gives the board a lot of opportunity to determine how they want to move forward, and knowing this board of supervisors, they will send it back to Measure B at least once. To review but in light of that to have more clarification should this committee want more clarification to vote on this um, recommendation it would be further to direct staff to research options associated with the development of said facility including design slash build slash bid and potential property or facility locations I second Wait, no, 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 no. <laughs> <laughs> What was your hand on? It to yeah, I'm, I'm, I, I have, um, including design slash so, build slash bid, if you could repeat from there, please. 
design slash bid slash build and potential property or facility location. So basically, you know, the thing is that, well, I didn't say this in our, in our motion, but what would happen is when this went to the board, if the board decided to direct staff, this is everything we would do. I just didn't spell it out. This is everything we would do. But do, anyway, I, do I have a second? second. So the, the, actually, the original seconder has to agree to the amendment. Yes, yes, thank you. You're correct. Sorry, my bad. <laughs> You're still not chair. <laughs> do, do I have any other further discussion? Public comment. Uh, I have some. Yeah. <laughs> um, Put your hands up. So, this specifically speaks to uh, um, the, the CRT and the, and the CSU together at this level. Yeah. I'm assuming it's speaking to those two because of the initial. Um, agreements that the county had entered into and it works good to have those two together however we're leaving off other facilities we're leaving off a puff we're leaving off a training facility are we limiting ourselves by not maybe bidding this as one facility large facility or in the same area by just limiting, narrowing it down these two CR, you know, the CRT and the CSR. CSR. Mr. Liberty, you are next. So it, it just seems to me that we're just uh, um, advocating our duty to make recommendations to the board. We're saying we're giving this very broad, sorry, this very broad, we think you guys should do something about mental health. Like, I mean, that's essentially as broad as we're talking about right now, instead of saying, here, this is how we should specifically apply this. And I'm thinking that we, the voters expected us to do more, to give more specific recommendations in that. Do you want do you want to defer? I'll defer to Ms. Angelo until she has As the maker of the motion, what I would like to say is it was only thirty minutes ago that what we did is the suggestion by Supervisor Hashjack and then Supervisor McCallan was to go around the room and for each member just to say what our top item was. That was after this board, this committee voted, one, to use the Kemper report as a guideline and then decided that we had all gone through the recommendations so we weren't going to go through the recommendations. So we each went around and said what we thought our top priorities were. I said my top priority was crisis stabilization. So as the maker of this motion, this motion has to do with crisis stabilization and crisis residential as, in my mind, being the top two. It doesn't have to be in your mind, but, it, but to me, I think they're the top two. So I just wanted to speak to that. And as far as packaging everything up and delivering one RFP for a 24-hour psychiatric facility, crisis stabilization, crisis residential, I'm not certain how we would do that. If we did that as one RFP, it would have to be three separate RFPs or three separate statements of work in one. Because I, I really can't imagine that someone who is going to bid on a 24-hour psychiatric facility is going to bid on a residential program and also crisis stabilization. So we have a lot of services here, and I'll just remind this committee that it's after 3 o'clock. Thank it's you. 3.30 rule. <coughs> So, yeah. um, I think that's perfectly um, legit from our discussion that we're talking about crisis stabilization, crisis residential, and um, I understand that we talk PUF as though it's the only option, but we haven't really defined what PUF is, and this is the one that's needed the most. So I don't see that this is being irrelevant. And I also don't see it as being, oh, this is, you know, the general mental health thing. This is, this is specific. Also, I'd like to, to bring up the, yeah. Also, I'd like to bring, bring up the fact, well, there, there are several things. First of all, I know the committee did not uh, um, consider the, uh, the current um, facility on Dora Street that used to be the general hospital. Um, but when a number of us considered it, the idea was of both crisis stabilization and crisis residential. Um, the second thing is that crisis stabilization and crisis residential work together. 
you know, it's not like they're just two separate things in the same building, you know, right? and the, the, um, the idea is hopefully that, that when somebody's stabilized, you know, maybe overnight in the emergency room and then in a locked facility that they'd be able to stay in the same facility without having to move, that they're stable enough on medications or through some counseling that they could stay in, in the crisis facility, that being crisis residential, without being locked. So that the two being in one building serves a utility, not just, uh, not just happening to be in the same facility. And that's all I have. Mr. Liberty, do you want to speak again? Or do you always like to keep I just always not, forget to knock it down. I, I just want to respond to uh, Ross and saying, um, you know, as the oversight committee, I, I think that uh, the voters realize that the board of supervisors may not have the last bite of the apple. We're asking, we're asking the board of supervisors to approve this, to, or to, to establish the RFP, and then if they are going to misspend the funds from Major B, then that's when the commission would say, we're the oversight, and we don't believe the board of supervisors is expending the money correctly. So, so uh, the voters, this would be perfectly okay, in my opinion, to send to the board of supervisors, and then we would watch with care and caution of what they're, how they proceed with it. Ms. Riley. Oh, I'd just like to say that I support the motion. I appreciate Ross's concerns about it seeming very general. I kind of believe the opposite. I, I think it's actually very specific, and it doesn't limit us to one specific project, one operator, one property. And so I appreciate that there would be um, staff uh, with some expertise doing the due diligence that will really help guide this committee in making an informed decision down the road. Thank you. Anybody else? Your pen's up. Is your pen up for a reason? Okay, any public comment? Hearing none, can I call Go ahead. Go ahead. I'm just kidding. Oh, it's Dan. You don't care about Thank you, Dan. Um, Dan Anderson with RCS. I, I appreciate the complexity and difficulty of this. I, I empathize and, 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 and have great respect for, you know, kind of how you guys are trying to figure this out. I just want to respond to a comment that Ross said earlier about the intellectual property and the work that RCS has, has put into this to date. Um, our priority, RCS and RQMC, is to get the service out to our community and, and our clients and to Mendocino County. Uh, you know, we have invested a lot of money in this, but it's it's what we do, and so I don't think we have a problem in terms of, of supporting, sharing, uh, you know, the, the work that we've done in terms of design, integrating that. Uh, I just want the, the the commission to know, and we're also we've said it before, and I'm just reiterating again. Uh, you know, the, the money that purchased the, the orchard property is, is a chop of grant that we would put together with the county. We really don't have a problem with saying, you know, take the property back and, and you know, let's do this together. So that's I mean, one of the, I think, uh, surprising things that, that has happened here over the last few years is the level of partnering that's happening between public and private involving RCS, involving our community in the county. So I guess I just want to, you know, everybody needs to be worried about you know, will we work together? Will we support? Will we do whatever needs done here to somehow, you know, bring this service to our community? That's what's important, not necessarily who owns or who gets what, and whatever way we can do to support that. That's where we're at. So thank you. Thank you, Dan. Thank you. Thank you, Tammy Moss Chandler, Director of Health and Human Services. I know your time is getting short, but I just wanted to speak briefly to the comments that were made about adding the psychiatric health facility to this plan as a public and human services director who's worked in four different counties. I've worked in a county that had a CSU connected to a PUF. I've worked in a county that's had a CSU connected to a CRT in the same building. I've worked in a county that had all three on the same campus and facility. So I think all of those are viable designs and I just wanna welcome that those three things I know are the top three priorities I've heard your committee talk about today, a psychiatric health facility, a crisis stabilization unit, and a crisis residential treatment uh, center. And I think there's real viability if that recommendation came from this group to the Board of Supervisors for them to do uh, research to help get to next. Thank you. Any other further public comment? Anybody? Your pen's not up, ma'am. That's because I've up the lead. Yeah, I, I would be uh, 
Chairman Muschietti, um, in light of our Health and Human Services Director's comments and also Member Lloyd's concern, uh, which is a good one, um, I, I actually am willing to amend my motion. Again. Yes. Okay. <laughs> okay. Oh, this is good. Yeah, it's perfect. I'm fine with that. To add, <laughs> to add, yeah. Carla, just mm -hmm. add one phrase, 24-hour psychiatric facility. So it would be crisis stabilization, crisis residential, and a 24-hour psychiatric facility. So we would be moving all three services forward to the board, the board with our recommendation that they begin the process of researching cost, location, service, whatever. So it would be all three. Are you OK with that? Um, my only concern is um, if, if Huff is um, subject to the uh, State Regulatory Commission, um, I would hate to see everything delayed for six years. Uh, that's my only concern. Yeah. So, so based on what I said when, when um, uh, Lloyd uh, brought, up, brought up a very good comment, is that we could do a request for proposal, <coughs> request for information, request for bid, whatever the board directs us to do, we could do it all as three separate statement of work. And what could happen is the information comes back and it shows that 24-hour psychiatric facility is going to take 18 months due to state regulations. Crisis stabilization may take four months, resident, you know, who knows. So I think if we if we approach it like that, I think we could send all three services to the board. I so are you seconding? I second. Shall I repeat it before we Please. Yes. <laughs> all right, so the final amended amended is um, Measure B Committee makes recommendation to the Mendocino County Board of Supervisors to explore utilizing Measure B funds for the development of a crisis stabilization and crisis residential facility and a 24-hour psychiatric facility. Further, that the Board of Supervisors direct staff to research options associated with such facility, including design slash builds, bid slash build, and potential property or facility locations. Is that correct? That is absolutely correct do i have any further comment questions i will call for the vote please carla <laughs> member diamond yes yeah. sheriff Allman. Aye. Uh, member riley yes member myrtle yes vice chairman moschetti i will get that right as well. you, you will no okay. problem yes <laughs> member ash yes um out of your weird yes member liberty oh sure you're yeah. i'll take that as a yes <laughs> <laughs> ceo angelo sure. yes Member McGordy? Yes. Dr. Miller? Yes. Motion carries unanimously. <laughs> and I've passed the gavel back to you. <laughs> Thank you, Mom. Is there any public oh, comment? I have a big choice. I have a big choice. I move we adjourn. Do you want to do the reports or just the reports? Oh, yes. It's so fun. Oh, you guys do. Thank you, gavel. Order! Thank you, gavel. I haven't a lot of time. Is that an adjournment? 4A, no. He recalled that. Or still here. Yes. Yes. Committee member reports. Committee member reports. Which stuff do you want to start? Uh, I, I do. Uh, not do committee reports. <laughs> 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 Everybody say no report. That's it. That's, That's it. it. Just say no report. report. No report. Nothing. Nothing at all. I'm going to talk to us. I move that we adjourn. Okay. No, we don't. All right. Yes, I will pick up everything. Thank you.